On this podcast, I interview Michael Schaefer, who's been in the supplement manufacturing business for over 30 years. Uh, full disclosure, Michael uh, and his company manufacture our supplements for XY Wellness and Mr. Happy. Um, and he is so knowledgeable in it. Um, throughout this podcast, we discuss all kinds of what I hope you find interesting, including you know what goes into... Um, getting that final product together that you find on the shelf uh, from the raw ingredients to the quality control, uh, government regulations, um, through that process of the machinery as the you know, raw material and ingredients go into capsules and that finally gets bottled. Um, I think you'll find it interesting. It will answer many of the questions that you have on quality control and quality assurance in nutraceutical supplements. Let's go. Welcome to the Dr. Geo Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my intention to help you with your urological function and live better with age. Today is a good podcast because I have our friend Michael Schaefer, who, as you probably already know from the intro, he's been involved in the manufacturing of supplements for a long time. So, Michael, thanks so much for being on the Dr. Geo Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Michael, you, you've been in the industry for a long time. Is it 30 years or, or, or more than 30 years? I know you started with a long time ago with PacNut. I thought you were 30 years with PacNut. So what's, what's, what's your history? Why did you go into this business? Were you um, into some other industry and then you went into the dietary supplement manufacturing business? What got you into the business? Well, I can say you know that it, it's a, it could be a little sordid story and a little colorful, but um, it, it was interesting. And how I basically got into uh -huh. it is that there was a gentleman who oh. knew of my talents and background, and, and he was uh, working with a number of naturopathic physicians, and he thought I could be helpful to the company, and so he invited me to join the team. Is that NF had, Formula? That was NF Formula. I remember and, a long uh, time ago. Right, right, and uh, uh, and you know when I went to Oregon State, and so I knew about Linus Pauling. Yeah, and so right. so anyways, so so with the vitamin C story, Oregon State naturopathic doctors, vitamins, botanicals. Right, I said, why not? Let's do it. What's the line? So, um, I know that Oregon State has the they have a very good nutritional website with scientific references and everything on nutrients and things. Refresh my memory. What's the association between Oregon State and Linus Pauling? Oh, actually, Linus Pauling, I, I believe, uh, was a professor at Oregon State for a while. And there's there's a building as uh, uh, the chemistry department, uh, you know, uh, named after him. Yeah. And then um, uh, he also got the Nobel Peace Prize. Right. So he's a you know very well respected, renowned uh, individual. Um, and so it was it was interesting for me is that back in 1994 I was a, actually able to uh, meet Linus Pauling before he passed away and he was still giving presentations um to medical physicians and um so that during that presentation I was able to learn the relationship between vitamin C right. and L lysine for a lipoprotein levels for cardiovascular support right. so that was one of those things that you know I was able to meet you know, I call it a mentor right. uh, in the nutritional industry back then. So that was kind of a, a very interesting uh, time and connection. Yeah, for uh, our listeners, Linus Pauling, I, I would call him the father of vitamin C. No, uh, wouldn't you, Michael? I mean, yes, a yes. lot of the papers yep. have been written, a lot of the information that we know in vitamin C. To me, is uh, uh, vitamin C is uh, one of the top vitamins. It does so much for your body, just like magnesium uh, on the mineral side. So you started with NF formula. Uh, as a naturopathic doctor, I mean, our roots are uh, with NF formula. I, I uh I, I think I'm, I, know, I don't know if I'm an old timer yet in the field. I've, I've been a naturopath for 20 years. I think, I think I'm getting there. But even our, all our teachers, uh, Dr. Sensening and so forth, and NF formula was, you know, the go to for us. Uh, great botanicals, great supplements. So how long were right. you with well, the, How long? I'm sorry, go ahead. 
I was, I was going to say the so the founders of NF were the, were part of the first graduating class right. from from NCNM at the time it was called that now see uh, the NUNM right. but anyway it, it, they had just re, uh, uh, transferred the the National College of Natural Medicine from Kansas to Portland right. in 1978 That's right. so it was it was that class of 1978. It was that group that started NF Formula. That's right. That's right. It's amazing history. So you were with NF for how long? Uh, just about 13 years. Wow. And then what happened? And then at the time, uh, this is part of the story that you were talking about your quality control, yeah. right? So, so what happened is that I attended for over 10 years medical conferences about, you know, um, you know, nutrition and, and botanicals and health with all the other doctors mm. right and and during that time i got you know i got a vast amount of knowledge mm. but then i started looking at the formulas that nf formulas was selling and i learned mm. that the products that we were selling could not be physically manufactured they weren't meeting their label claims. I see. So, so I convinced the owners at the time that the only way for us to have that quality control was to start our own manufacturing operation. Oh, well. so so I so I so we did that. We cleaned up all the formulas, and I and I helped participate in because of my educational background and and redoing all those formulations and then with, with uh, better quality it, control uh methods with, exactly better quality controls with testing and making sure we had all the you know the, the products where were, they are what they said they were going to be right. right so so after we started manufacturing i discovered that we, uh, the brand and our formulas didn't really have that much business for to for, for, for to be manufacturing on our own. I see. So so then I learned that I could make products for other people as well, and in doing that, I created a contract manufacturing business. So NF the NF formulas then grew the next four years substantially, where the owners decided to sell the company. They sold and it. To, to North Castle Partners, which what they yeah. did was they took together they took together several brands in the uh, healthcare practitioner space. They had NF formulas, Tyler, right. uh, Vitaline, and Enzymatic Therapy, right. and put them all together into a new company called Integrative Therapeutics. That's right. And there's an integrative therapeutics is a brand yeah. that's in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Right. So at that time, I was given a choice. There, it was to go to Green Bay, Wisconsin, and run the operations there. Oh, or or not. And so and so there was another company uh, called Pacific Nutritional in the Vancouver, Washington area that needed an executive to who to, to run their manufacturing for contract manufacturing, and they gave me the opportunity to. Uh, being owner and operator of that company as uh, president at the time, yeah. and then eventually I became the CEO. Um, so yeah, that was uh, how I transitioned from NF Formulas to Pacific Great. Nutritional. How, how long were you at Pacific for? Um, I was there for fifteen years. Yeah, yeah, and then it sold, if I remember correctly. Well, I was. That was a funny story as well because I actually was trying to buy my partners out. Yeah, and um, that deal fell through with the Equity Group and. Um, uh, then we didn't see eye to eye, so I decided to exit, and then mm. um, because I didn't like what they were, my partners wanted to do, and and eventually the Pacific Nutritional sold to another company. I see. That's correct. Right. Right. Amazing. So you total. Uh, so it's it is about thirty, a little bit more than thirty years that you've been you've been in the business. Right. 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 And so then they decided. It was then for, you know with my current you know. Uh, uh, business i decided to start everything from scratch That's again right. too so yeah so that was the the whole thing so now I've, you know you, you know i have no no partners um right uh you know and nobody else to answer to but to but to maintain that you know the same quality uh systems and and make products for other people we, we i decided to you know start up everything from scratch and and uh and build a new business right. uh that would be supportive of you know the smaller companies that mm. that need assistance in getting into the manufacturing of supplements full disclosure i think our our uh, audience knows this but we you you do uh and your company they manufacture uh the supplements for xy wellness and the uh, uh mr happy uh men's health line so uh, both which i am uh, affiliated with and 
formulator. So that's that's our disclosure. And one of the reasons why we work with you, Michael, is because of your uh, meticulousness uh, as it relates to quality. Um, l- let's take this from the top. So you have a you have a bottled supplement and it's labeled and you buy it either from a store or you get it in a box from you know from uh, uh once it's shipped to you you open it and there it is right this you know, this bottle of pills but a lot goes into <laughs> creating that bottle of pill uh, um uh, of supplement pills so take us Take us from the top as to what's that journey like from from the raw material, the ingredients to that 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 uh, end product. And before you do that, let's define. I mean, right before we started recording, we were talking about loose terms and things that we don't really know what they mean. We use these terms, but we don't know what certain terms mean. And one of them, uh, one of them uh, is quality control. Is I think is used loosely uh, amongst uh, people, uh, quality control, and this and that, and there's some marketing behind that. What does that mean as it relates to supplement? What does quality control mean? Well, that's um, an interesting question. You know, because uh, <laughs> quality control can mean a lot of different things. Um, essentially, what it, it means is that. Everything that you know that you do is documented and reproducible, mm-hmm. and 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 th- that's what it really you know is is the crux of what's important about this. Because I wanted to bring up you know before making a product, you have to design the product. Yeah. So so that's where it basically all starts, and, and quality control starts with. The, 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 the creation of the product formula and the specifications of each individual ingredient in the formulation. So okay. that becomes the beginning of your quality control mm-hmm. because the, because ultimately what you need to do is once you have your 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 your, uh, your specifications set is to not make any deviations from those specifications. Right. Right. So. Yeah, so the, you know that, that's the sense. You know, because quality control is making sure everything's being performed and done to the specifications outlined in how you set up the product formula and recipe. In other words, what what's on the label should be what's in the bottle, correct? Correct, and and everything. Like even if you're, I was speaking of analogies. So if you're going to be baking a recipe of, of for. In the kitchen, you have your recipe, you have your ingredients, and it tells you what step by step what you need to do. Yeah. And so, if you do everything like you're supposed to do, you know, as outlined in this in the recipe, you'll have a good quality product. If you make any deviations from that, you could or you might not have a, a good quality product, right. depending upon what's been deviated. Right. And the reality is, Michael, that. You can sell supplements, right? No one will stop you from selling supplements that are poor quality, that has something different than what's in the label, unless something happens. Unless something happens to a consumer, then the government intervenes. But there is no, uh, I mean, do, through Deshea, there is some regulation, but there's not, there's no, no regulation. In other words, anybody can just say, yeah, I'm going to start cre- formulating supplements and manufacturing supplements and no one will stop them. Is this the case? Well, no, that's not exactly true mm-hmm. as you stated mm-hmm. it. Because um, to, to manufacture supplements and market them, you do need to, by law, um, follow uh, the good manufacturing guidelines set up by the Federal Go- uh, uh, Drug Administration, G- so uh, FDA, also known as GMP guidelines, right? Right. So, so you do. So, so in an essence, to manufacture and to market supplements it's very similar to a drug product with the problem that you know that the drug companies have with with our industry is that we don't require pre-market approval right that we, we have to do ever just about everything that they need to do but we don't have to tell the you know, get permission from the government before we do it mm. now what you're saying though anybody could do what you just said is to put together something and start selling it without having everything in place but you know, it'd be like you can be speeding down the road, but as long as you don't get 
caught, mm. you don't get a ticket, right? right. So, but 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 good, you know, re- uh, responsible, reputable individuals are not going to be going 100 miles an hour down a road when the speed limit is 55. Right. You you're, you're you're you should be going 55 60 miles an hour, right? So that but but you know, but the, the um uh but you could get behind the car and start driving without a driver's license because until you get caught you you know um uh, yeah, nobody really knows. So but but responsible people are supposed to be, do things the responsible way. Right. So, so that's technically where you speaking that. One can do that, though they're going to get into they likely get into in trouble at some point, whether it is uh, because there's so who comes around to regulate you uh, and say, yeah, you're you're following GMP practices or or you're not. Who, who's coming around to to your facility to uh, um, to to regulate? Right. So we both have you know federal and state inspectors. So the so the FDA does inspect uh, facilities. Uh, we've had FDA here twice, mm-hmm. and we have no observations. And and then we also have an annual uh, state inspector come in every year just to make sure that uh, we're we're in compliance with uh, the, the manufacturing requirements for you know the the, the state as well. Mm-hmm. So and then we, of course we have third party GMP certifiers come in once or twice a year. Um, but, but, and our and most. Um, uh, industry clients uh, that require that we maintain and adhere to to those third-party GMP uh, programs. So that way, you know, they they have evidence that we are following the rules because FDA doesn't provide uh, uh, like a a certificate saying we pass. They they only give you, you know, uh, pieces of paper and say you fail. Ah, I see. So the third parties uh, party, uh, uh, are the ones that give you that piece of papers that you passed that's correct or or, or at least at that time right you know you know they don't never know when you when you when you don't do something right but right. But, but they know that you know at that time when they inspect you that you're doing everything okay the, the way you're supposed to be now it's every company required to have a third party surveyor or that's not required to have a, a dietary supplement manufacturing facility it, it's not required, but many, you know, you know, I guess it's for manufacturers, many of the uh, of the clients suggest that that you know they won't, or, you know, if you don't have one, they're not going to give you the business, right? That's so, right. So, yeah, so so you you almost need to have it uh, just to be in business. Not say you don't have to, but to to have a, a good clientele, you you do need to have. Yeah, it. I mean, I that's sort of what we did as well. We said, look, I, and 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 there, how many? third-party surveyors companies or organizations are there i know that one of them is nsf which is uh, probably a very common one there's ul um i think i think your uh your third-party surveyor is ul is that correct that's correct yeah yeah and then there's a few more there's sgs and and a few others why it not to not to uh, 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 not to uh, get into the weeds with regards to um, you know, third third party surveyors, but why is NSF so popular? Because <laughs> they seem everybody, you know, even amongst lay people, are asking, "Are you NSF certified?" And it's like, well, how do you know about these third party surveyors, and and why are you asking about NSF? So, why is NSF uh, the one of the ones that uh, it seems like many people are familiar with? Well, they've done a good job marketing. Pretty is that much, what it I is? Was, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to be disparaging anyway, yeah. but they weren't my, they weren't my favorite at the beginning, and they're still not my favorite. But uh, <laughs> but they uh, uh, but they but they are uh, good at you know their marketing um, because if you you know because it wasn't until two thousand and seven that the that the FDA you know finalized and mandated the final rules for GMP. Mm. And so it really hasn't been that many years. It's only been like 13 plus years mm. um, before, 14, well, I guess 15 now. So 15 years that, uh, that the rule uh, for the GMP guidelines have been in place uh, for, and the industry has been around, you know, since the turn of the century. So it, really the, the rules haven't been in so place what happens, for that long. Be, what happened before 2007? 
Uh, well, it was, it was a, the shave passed in 1994, right. and that was called the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act, right? right? Tell us a little bit about and, that act, if you can, for those that don't well, know. Well, yeah, well, it was interesting because they had NF formulas. We had U.S. Marshals coming at us with guns and everything like that yeah. because we had a product called AngioGar, yeah. which is to help with cardiovascular support. Yeah. Nowadays, AngioGuard would be um, an accepted term because of the Dietary Supplement Health Education <laughs> Act, which allowed companies that marketed supplements to uh, use structure function claims to tell people what the products are for. Right. And uh, but, but, but so you but, can't but you can't say this will cure you or diagnose you with anything. Uh, this won't cure your, uh, your your hypertension or things, but you can say things like angioguard. So this is so, will this will so support your blood vessels or support mm-hmm. your heart and things like that. Right, support healthy heart function, whatever. Yeah. That, that's those type of terms. Because the, and that's what the part of the compromise was. That's why you see on every product label, it says these statements are not have not been approved by the Food and Drug Administration, right. and they're not intended to treat, diagnose, cure, or prevent disease. Right. That was the kind of compromise during the passage of that law. Right. And um, um, and then you know in, in, in 1994, part of that law, right? You said yeah, in 94, yeah. right? And so in in and in that you know act, there was also the FDA was given enforcement rights on how to inspect supplement manufacturers, right. and and so so the so they came up in 97 these guidelines for GMP, but then it took 10 years for FDA to to finalize them. Mm-hmm. That's how the 2007. Then they had a, a a phase in period where the larger companies needed to be there, uh, need to be in place in one year, mid size two years, and small companies three years. Mm-hmm. And the the good thing for for me was that because I've been an industry uh, leader and participated on a number of boards and committees as as chair as the chairperson, I knew what the rules. We're going to be because I was helping shaping the rules. I see, and so and so as 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 because I was helping shape the rules, then the cup at Pacific Nutritional, I was able to implement all the things that we're going to need over a ten year period versus over a two year period. I see. Right, <laughs> right. So 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 it made it easier um, for for us. To, and so right when the rules came into place, I was the one of the first companies that was um, uh, certified GMP by a third party, and so the, so. So it was, you know, uh, that's why GMPs were, 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 you know, well thought to be of most importance to a manufacturer. Sure, sure. Great. That, that's 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 good history uh, to know wh- how we are, wh- why we are where we are with uh, with dietary supplements uh, and manufacturing practices. All right. Let's just say, let's give a a, a good example here. So. You know, in our product of, let's say, GD Toxel that you manufacture for, for us, I, there's a, a variety of ingredients in it. But let's just say, let's just say there's milk thistle, which there is, <laughs> vitamin C and zinc. Let's just say there's three ingredients. There's a couple of more, but let's just say those three ingredients. How, okay, so here, Michael, this is the formula. The formula is um, X amount of milligrams uh, of milk thistle, um, uh, X amount of minigra- uh, milligrams of vitamin C, X amount of zinc, um, in a 30 day serving, um, let's say, uh, two pills a day. So 60, 60 pills in a bottle. Um, wh- what do you do at that point? How do you start that process? Well, it's interesting, you know, because, you know, like I said, because of my extensive background in, in product development, uh, I have the fortunate pleasure of knowing the densities, um, you know, the characteristics of just about every single ingredient there is in the supplement uh-huh. space. So, and density um, is like literally the the th- almost like the thickness of the each ingredient. So to learn how much of it you can actually uh, fit into a into a capsule, depending on the size of the capsule, is that right? right? Particle size, yeah. particle size, and middle and molecular weight. Yeah, right. And, and so, uh, and so, yeah. So, like, so then you, to, you know, then of course, with the, looking at um, the, the scientific research, then you'd also determine what would be efficacious dosages right. for milk thistle. Usually, you know, one hundred sixty to three hundred twenty milligrams a day. You know, vitamin C. Right. 
they've, they've actually confirmed my original proposal that between 270 to 300 milligrams a, a, a day is is optimal. Yeah. So so that yeah, but but, but 90 milligrams is the as the daily value right. established by Which the Which just by prevents the FDA. 90 milligrams not to not to digress, <laughs> but 90 mer- milligrams of vitamin C a day just pretty pretty much prevents scurvy, right? I mean, it doesn't do a whole lot more than that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Then of course, you know, you know, you think in selenium, but they have, you know, uh, daily value re- recommendations as well. Right. So, so you have to determine what else they might be taking or exposed to because, you know, there are, you know, uh, zinc can, you know, be an emetic. So if you get too much, yeah. you don't want to, uh, you know, have adverse events. So right, you of have course. to kind of be, you have to look at some safety. So you look at what else they might they be taking or exposed to. So you, you put into what we, you would believe would be uh, a basic therapeutic dose. Right. Then you put that together into uh, your specifications. Right. You s- select your vendors, and then you well, never you're sele- change. You're selecting the <laughs> vendor. So let's a, a, a real scenario is this is a real scenario. I formulate. I put it in a spreadsheet. I, I formulate the specs. I send it to you, and you say okay. And you you you, you know you say okay. We you know we we'll, we agree on a on a cost. And then you go and you start getting uh, the ingredients, the raw material, and they come in in some bag, right? They they appear, or you have it already. How how does that work? How do you go about obtaining? Let's say in this case, just keep it simple: milk thistle, vitamin C, and zinc. How, how, what's that process like? Right, right. So, you know, uh, we have uh, a process of, uh, you have to begin with, the, you have to have approved a vendor. Yeah. So, so we have vendors that have been vetted and approved to purchase materials from. Right. And so we have, uh, you know, approved vendors for milk sales. Yeah. Right, for example, right? And then, you know, and there's different types of milk thistle. There's milk thistle powder. Yeah. There's milk thistle ratio extract. There's milk thistle standardized extract, UV Viz method. And there's milk thistle extract standardized HPLC method. Yeah. So, so based upon which ingredient is we put in that formula, we, we purchase that material from that specific vendor. Mm-hmm. And and so then, we, we, and then when the material is purchased and then when the product is received, we then have to confirm that what was received is what we ordered by doing, we have an internal test method for uh, FTNIR, which is uh, of, um, uh, infrared, uh, near, you know, like spectrum photometry. So we, we confirm that method and we also use HPTLC, which is a high performance thin layer chromatography to confirm that that milk thistle is what it's supposed to be and then we then stamp it as a qc approved and released before it can go into our inventory right and pause right there for a second because that's actually a very good point there are a couple of things you said number one is in in botanical medicine sometimes it's standardization and i don't want to get to the weeds with that but the bottom line is with milk thistle and he's sometimes it could be standardized to have i don't know a certain amount uh, of uh, of uh, psilocybin or psilomarin I, i forgot the uh, well, both. Yeah, there's a saliven S- and there's silamara. Right. So, yeah. it, it, so there's a variety of uh, different types depending on what one, what what we what we want. But these three bulks of of materials, so vitamin C, milk thistle, and zinc, they all look the same, pretty much. So what you're well, saying, milk thistle, milk thistle is yellow. It's a little yellow, vitamin right? Vitamin C is white, right. <laughs> and zinc's white. So vitamin C is, is is white and zinc's white, but they have different particle size. Correct. So, yeah, and, and you yeah, would yeah. know. So so correct. And of course, curcumin is like bright yellow or orange. But so right, oftentimes right. Yeah. these things look the same. So you're saying, all right, we need to make sure that this is exactly what it needs to be. So we'll do some testing to make sure that. It's indeed the type of milk thistle that we want. Uh, make sure exactly. that vitamin C is the vitamin C we want. Make sure that the zinc is the vi- zinc that we want. Um, right. Well, exactly. Well, prior to Deshay in, in in the ninety eighties and nineties, that was always a joke in the botanical industry. Was that was it was the material receiving was it coming out coming out of the brown barrel, green barrel, or tan barrel? <laughs> so so so, so because, because the quality control wasn't really quite there. That's why the doctor branded products at the time were the more respected ones because we were doing more of the identity testing to make sure that we were getting the materials that of the plant materials that we really wanted to use it was a wild wild west back then before the share wasn't it yes it was (laughs) yes so the share not not to go back on it but 
it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good um, act uh, that I think that we benefit from and many other countries don't. Is that right? Yes, I, I think, and, and the, uh, I guess, unfortunately, um, the FDA and, and industry really hasn't allowed the SHEA to really be fully utilized. And, and another analogy that, you know, that I can relate to is like my automobile. I, I can buy a new car, but I'll just, I just know where the, the gas pedal, the brakes, there. I don't know all the features that it could do. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm very basic you know i just i just use it to do what i just need to do to just drive home to, to work and everything right. but i don't know all the functions that can but so the same thing like is it the shea act there's so many things about that that people aren't really aware mm. or utilize that you know that it, it could be really enhanced and robust but people just know about the basic stuff yeah right right, right. um all right so we know it's milk, milk so each each bag or barrel of material comes with a certificate of analysis. Is that right? And that certificate of analysis tells Correct. you, yep, that's in, that's milk thistle. And I've always seen that. And and do any is every company required to do independent testing to make sure, or is that not required? In other words, they just look at the certificate of analysis that says, yep, that's milk thistle, and this is the type of milk thistle that you want, and take that for. Uh, for for value and then just start manufacturing is uh, i mean is that no can they do that or Every, that's not the right thing to do no i guess you know when everybody had to be in compliance so since 2010 when everybody you know can no, you can't no longer just rely on the piece of paper that you receive with the product right. i mean that's just you the printout have- Right. So you so everybody must this is a you know, must identify the material that's coming in. Now right. you don't have to use third party labs. You can use your in in house laboratory, uh, but but you have to have the validated methods to do the work, in, and you have to have the good laboratory practices to uh, in house to to assure that you're doing the work correctly. So so it is easier to use third party labs because there's less work you have to prove to the government that you're doing it correctly right all right we know it's vitamin c we know it's the right specs we also look for other things microbes and metals and things like that is that right isn't that part of the qc quality control aspect well that's part of the specifications that you know many companies in, in the industry have to help show and, and demonstrate safety of the product yeah. so you know, on your on your microbiological profiles you, you know you have your total plate count you know for just sort of how many organisms are just potentially there uh then you have of course then you have to your pathogens so you know those are the ones that are for mainly for you know to ensure safety you know the e coli yeah. salmonella you see that in the food all the time so, spinach and le- lettuce have you know it's salad bars they got you know e coli or salmonella right. you know you know so you don't you know make sure that's none of that in their product and then then of course like with the the heavy metals is that you know because we know that especially a, a, you as a doctor knowing that you know things like arsenic yeah. cadmium lead mercury yeah. could have a negative effect on the body sure. so we don't want to have that present in the products we are selling to to consumers Right. So that's tested for. Okay. So now we know that, you know, nothing comes with no, or some things have some metal. It's just a very minute amount because it comes from nature. And many of these things come from nature. So you can't have a zero of, of, of mercury. Is that right? I mean, it depends on what we're talking about, I guess. Right. Well, mercury is not very common, but but you know, but but your lead is for, is, for example, because of all the fossil fuels over all these decades, you know, they you know, uh, you know, all the carbons you know that have fallen into the uh, the soil over time. If you have any plant product that you know grows out of the ground, you know that you know um, you know, especially if it's a root, um, uh, the uh, will have more amounts of lead than than for example yeah. the plant parts that are leaves so the the aerial parts won't want to have the same concentration but but what you know but the plants pick up within the soil right and and just yeah whatever is in nature it's you know it could be you know organic land but still you can't help help what ha- happens from the air yeah dropping the, you know things on the ground through through the rain droplets and, and all those other things you, you just can't can't get again avoid it but what you, we can do what we can to uh, put together formulations and, and ingredients right. that use the cleanest least contaminated materials as possible speaking of organic um 
what's the deal with organic uh, botanicals? And the reason why I'm asking, because I get asked, you know, I, I know why one would want organic things is you want less pesticides and less herbicides and sort of um, uh, chemicals and, and you, you want it to be as pure as possible. Two questions for you in that regard. <laughs> Number one, where do many of the botanicals come from? Um, I know that people have concerns when they come from China, but China does produce a lot of botanicals. Um, so what's that? How do you vet for the quality control when botanicals come from China, assuming that a lot of them come from China? So the first question is, where, where are these botanicals coming from? How much of it comes from China? And from the, the percentage that does come from China, how do we vet? How do we know that those are legitimate? Because we always have quality uh, concerns as it relates to anything that comes from China. Right. Well, there you're right. There's a lot of materials that come from China, but with the plant, in, you know, um, plants are really more to where they're, you know, indigenous. You know, there's, you know, cloves maybe from our Madagascar, right. you know, and, you know, then you have Eastern Europe, you know, North America, South America, you know, all over the, you know, China, India, that they're, you know, you know, um, yeah, because you know, like the the, the turmeric, you know, that's more indigenous to India. Yeah. So, yeah, so it it just depends upon more where the the plants are more in, 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 indigenous from. Now, of course, you know, like for organics, a lot of organics are coming from China mm -hmm. uh, and and or the U.S. Um, because in China, their government doesn't allow the use of certain pesticides and and uh and they you know and you know same thing with like the non-gmo so they they have um you know where the united states you know will use gmo seeds mm -hmm. where the um uh but the chinese government will not and so uh so so they so that's where you know a lot of the uh things that are cultivated uh using organic or non-gmo they will come from China. So you're you saying, know? so here we are, we're saying, uh, you know, we don't trust things that come from China. And what you're probably saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is if we think that non-GMO and organic is better, better quality, then most of these botanicals that are non-GMO and organic are coming from China. Yeah, that would be mostly true. Like, because the U.S., you know, has a limited amount of, uh, materials that they, you know, a, a variety of things that they, we, we, we grow on a commercial basis here in the United States. Yeah. So, so that's where, you know, there's a, there's a limited supply of the, uh, from, you know, domestic source. And, and most of it is from international. Right. Interesting. Uh, what percentage you think comes from the U S uh, versus other places? I'm just curious. Would you know that? I mean, I know it's a very general question, but just like from botanicals uh, in general, uh, what percent? I know salt palmetto comes from the U.S., but what percentage you think comes from the uh, U.S.? Um, I would say I would guess maybe about thirty thirty five percent. We we have the ingredients. We've identified them. They have you know they 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 passed uh, testing. Now what? What happens? Uh, not so we need to put all these things into capsules. So what ha what's the next step? Once we've got our formula designed and everything like that, so. So um, uh, to get into manufacturing, we, everything has a, a master manufacturing record, which is your recipe. Mm -hmm. And so that, and so the, you know, so, so every production batch is a direct replication of the master manufacturing mm -hmm. record, except with the exception is that we assign it a manufacturing lot number. Mm -hmm. And so, so, uh, so the first step is to you know uh, weigh and then blend all of the ingredients according to the specifications of the amount of in the in in that formulation and then once that is done then uh we have our quality control strap to make sure that the, the blend is homogenous and then then once we determine that then we then move it into the encapsulation stage where the, uh, the equipment that's used to manufacture the capsules uh is set up and then we just put the uh, the powder into the you know, machinery where they start to be, produce the capsules, and then we stop and make sure that the the, the weight of the powder ingredients that are going into the capsules are in compliance with those specifications. So there's specifications on every step of the way from designing the the product all the way into manufacturing the capsules there's you know every step there's a specification that quality control and the QA department has to sign off to confirm that that what was being 
performed is correct and accurate. So we now we got the machine going, and now we're at the point where uh, the machine is putting the the, the specs, uh, all the ingredients into capsules. Uh, let's just say, for argument's sake, we're doing a hundred thousand capsules. I don't know. I'm just pulling that number out of the air. How long does that process take? How many people are there watching to make sure that, yep, that that everything is happening the way it should? Uh, no kind of um, faulty capsules. Some, you know, sometimes there are capsules that are not filled or whatever. How many people are with in you know in the middle of each run, and and how long does that process take? Let's just say for about a hundred thousand capsules or so. Right, right. Of course, you know everything depends because you know. If the batch size is only a hundred thousand, that might be on a smaller machine, which it might take a day, day and a half, for the manufacturing of those capsules. Okay. And, and with that, there'd be you know just a single operator, but then your QA uh, uh, process is to every fifteen minutes is to record the the weights of those capsules. Every fifteen minutes. Okay. Right, right. So if it takes it, you know, so that and that could be, you know, a hundred times, mm. you know, between you know, from start to finish. And um, uh, but of course, if you know, if it's a, if the batch size was greater than a hundred thousand, there's machines that can do forty thousand to a hundred thousand an hour, and so those capsules machines, you know, can you know those capsules be produced at a much higher rate. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So the so um, so yeah, so so but the same fifteen minute rule. If we're checking the capsule weights, still applies. So, the, in, in terms of how much time does it take, depends on the machinery that you use. Correct. Okay. Yes. And then, and then after the uh, capsules are made, then there's another, you know, uh, it's, it's a process of, you know, yeah. going through and inspecting and sorting out. All you mentioned, you know, capsules are either dented, uh, um, partially filled, um, you know, uh, tucks, whatever. They there's a you know the polisher to get all the dust off. There's a, there's another process where another two or three people are involved with in that ins- inspection of, of making sure that all the you know the the viable capsules are proceed to the packaging stage. Right. Between one, so then you have the next um, formula with different specs coming in. How long between one, um, the manufacturing of what lot, one lot number, uh, 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 how long does it take between one lot number and, and another lot in terms of, uh, because there's a cleaning process. So you want to make sure right. right, that there's no ingredients from the last batch uh, uh, in the machine. And I, my understanding is that it takes some time to clean the machine to to to, to then start another uh, lot. So how, what, how much time does that take? Well, of course, it depends on machine and also on the formula that you right. <laughs> that yeah that you that you had before. Because some things that you know, especially if you're dealing like with water soluble ingredients, so on a, a small machine, it would take maybe four to six hours on, on average with the a formula that is more soluble in water and solu- so it could be washed and clean. But then there's some materials that are very challenging, like your quercetin, turmeric, and those type of things. It might take eight to twelve Ooh. hours to do the same same machine because it doesn't clean up as easy as something that's more water soluble, right? right? So, so yes, yeah, so, and and of course, at the higher speed machines, that could be anywhere from a one to two day uh, clean and changeover process. Wow. Uh, so you know it, it, that's a, that's an important component, at least from an uh, interesting perspective, with everything that goes into creating the end product. Right, um, you, you're not using that machine. If you look at it from a business perspective, um, depending on what you're ordering uh, and what the specs are, that machine may not be used to manufacture something because it's being cleaned for six, eight, ten hours or so. Right, exactly. But you go back to my restaurant analogy. You know, you have to wash your dishes, right? So you can't just use the same dish over and over sure, and over again. Sure. But so, so, so as a business, the manufacturers just have more machines. Yeah, right. So, so that way we just you know, if you only had one machine, you you're not in produce business very much. You're not in business. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, all right. So now we have all these capsules filled with the zinc, vitamin C, and milk vessel based on those specs that were given to you. Now they need to be bottled. Is that is that another a separate machine where now it's just bottling uh, 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 the, the 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 supplements? Correct. The, you know the 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 basic you know machine that 
it's called a, you know it's called a counter will count the number of capsules that go into the bottle but then there's other machinery that is part of that process made to put, based upon the specifications, do you put in a desiccant? Do you put in cotton? And then, you know, then there's a machine that screws the lids on. And then there's a machine that will put the, the little band on the outside. Yeah. And then there's, and then you have your heat tunnel to shrink the bands. And then you have your label applicator. <laughs> and then you have your inkjet machine to put this up. So you have lots of different That's machinery right. to do all the different little pieces. Right. Uh, to when, when the bottle comes out, you're going, oh, there's all these things with that bottle. And there was... So maybe eight or ten different machines along the way because there's also metal detectors, the check weighers, and all those other things that are involved on the packaging line to make sure that everything is correct. Wow, the des the desic what desiccator is that little bag uh, that that's filled with what silica inside? Correct. It's, it has a silica gel to to absorb moisture that you know c- could potentially uh, compromise the integrity and the potency of the ingredients inside the capsule. Now we know, folks. Now we know that little annoying uh, little bag that's in every bottle that I've ever opened. Sometimes you you know you're pouring your pills in, in, in your hand, and then that little bag comes out. That's what that does. It 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 um, it absorbs the uh, the moisture, right? Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We also there. There are also some uh, um, desiccants that are also carbon based. Mm-hmm. So some, and that absorbs odor. Because and then we and then there's some that are a combination of carbon and silica. So it absorbs moisture and odor. Uh, so it, so it depends upon the, the 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 product. And mostly they're they're silica because uh, that's the main thing. But but there are additional options. So now we have our final product. It's all uh, wrapped up and, <laughs> and sealed. Everything is there. I know there is. Um, I've noticed within the last several years that some companies on the label are placing not an expiration date, but a manufacturing date. And sometimes the optics are not great because if it says, you know, uh, here we are, November of 2022, it says manufacturing date, you know, October 2021. You're saying, well, my thing is old. So why is that happening and, and why the change? Is that a governmental mandate? What, why is that happening? If, if you mention that, because, you know, because I've been in the industry a long time, I've participated in, in, in the creation of all, a lot of these type of uh, rules. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was um, when, the third, when, when, the, uh, when the GMPs first came out in 2007, some people started to switch over from expiration dates to manufacturing dates. And the, partly because they were being, you know, concerned about not having enough data for, for uh, stability data to, you know, to demonstrate uh, a good expiration date. Well, the, 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 when I asked the FDA about that, they, about using a manufacturing date, the, their, their, their question was like, why would you do that? It has no benefit to consumers. It's confusing and it doesn't mean anything. So right. in, 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 in essence, in essence, if you know, uh, you're not, there's nothing on the, on that product saying that the product will ever expire. And so it's even worse. Right. It's, it's worse. It's better to have no date at all than to have a manufacturing date. Cause the <laughs> manufacturing date just tells you what day it was produced. And that's it. So that is, an option and, for industries to the to not have any any dates on it. That is an option. Yeah, the, the, the expiration dates aren't a requirement at all. Now they, you know, of course, you know the the, the main purpose that I- ingredient suppliers and manufacturers and marketers put dates on products in my opinion, is to limit liability. Mm-hmm. So, you know, cuz you don't want, you know, something to, you know, be on somebody's you know, medicine cabinet at home for 15 years, yeah. not to say it would harm anybody, but you don't know if it would or not. Right. And so, and so why would we want to take that chance? So we're going to say, well, if you don't use it in three or four years, well, best of luck to you. It's no longer our responsibility. Right. Right. So, so I think that's the main reason. Uh, but the, but the, but the, the secondary reason, there are some materials that do degrade over time. The nice thing about supplements is that they don't morph into something different, like a drug product. They can turn into some some different chemical, ah. and uh, after a period of time, and then they can be harmful. Where you know, um, you know, you know, like a B vitamin, like diamond, will lose maybe about four percent potency per year. 
So you just know that, you know, that we, when you formulate with overages, you put in, you know, X number of percentage more. So it, so it starts out at a higher than label claim. And then over a period of two or three years, it'll still meet label claim. And then after that three years, it may or may not meet label claim, but it's not going to be harmful. So that, that's the, that's mainly so the, the reason. So the bottle in my cabinet that's been around for four years, it, it probably lost a little potency, but but that's it. It's not harmful. No no uh, uh, microbes are growing in there. Um, what if it's a botanical? What is there if there's plant material in there? Is it possible that something can grow in there? Some, some unwanted well, uh, little uh, bug. It, it, depends, it depends upon the ingredient. It's funny you mentioned that because I just did a test. Um, we, we had these this laxative formula, but it was all just botanical ingredients, and it was um, uh, 18 years old, mm. right? We still tested it. It still met all the potencies for anthroquinones, and it still was effective. And it, it, you know, so it was, it was still good 18 years later. Mm. Of course, you know I don't want to be responsible for that product for eighteen years, but but yeah, but but still, it didn't didn't lose potency because it, you know it didn't stop being that herb. Right, it, that, that herb stayed it, and, and it was in a bottle. It was closed. It was you know it was it was it was safe, but but uh, but there are some things that you know, especially organic material. Because but or, organic materials tend not to be you know like heat treated or whatever mm. for for micro, microbials, and so they could could potentially uh, if if there's moisture involved, that's why the desiccant's in there. Because if there's moisture in the bottle, moisture will can you know make microbes grow, right? And so without the moisture, then it doesn't grow, and and, and then it's still safe. Is there? Let I me mean, ten years. Uh, what at what point? Because uh, I, I see consumers panicking, and if they had it for a year, you know, sitting on a cabinet, they, just, they dump it. Is there a time for whatever reason that you would say, yeah, after a certain amount of time, uh, five years, six years, uh, you need to get rid of it and get a new batch, it, 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 or, or not really? Basically, a good rule of thumb: is you look at the organoleptics, mm-hmm. right? So if it smells really bad. Yeah. Don't take it. Right. <laughs> if it you know, unless it's a, it starts out fresh smelling bad, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, fi- like fish th- oils. If it smells like rotten fish, <laughs> it's not good. Something is off there, or there's a spill in 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 the bottle. Right, right. Or and or if the capsules, if they normally like say they're beige color, but now they're all dark spots yeah. and everything. I was like, well, maybe you should do not take that one. You know, so so it's really a lot of common, common sense. sense yeah. You know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. If it, if it looks, smells, and it doesn't appear to be what it looked like when you first got it, then something's probably not right. Right, right. Well, we got our final product, and we're taking it, and we're good to go. <laughs> and we know that we can have it as long as it doesn't smell or look different. Uh, we can take it for for a while, though. Uh, you know, certainly as a prescriber uh, of nutraceutical supplements, <laughs> they shouldn't be around for too long. Much uh, longer than about thirty days, right? Um, right. Well, that's the main thing too, because you know, because now you're talking about back to the main, first question about health. Yeah, exactly. If you want to have want to have a healthy status right. of your body, you need to keep continuing to take the nutrients. It's not uh, it's not a one day fix. Consistency. Right? That's right. You need to be consistent. <laughs> Well, Michael, that I, I think I, I think I ran out of uh, uh, questions. Um, it, that was wonderful. Um, anything else that you want to add with regards to um, manufacturing of nutraceutical supplements? Well, the one thing I still want to reinforce is that you know we we are an FDA regulated industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, we you know the, the the good people follow the rules, the bad people don't. Mm-hmm. But it's like anything in, in life, criminals are criminals. Yeah, and so so, we, so you know you can't you don't want to punish the 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 good people for for criminal behavior. Right. So um, so um, uh, so we are an FDA regulated uh, regulated uh, industry. Uh, the the the, the Big national brands, they're they're actually you know pro- providing good quality products. Mm-hmm. So it's no longer you know um, you know one group's better than another group because of the the field's mostly level. So it's um, so everybody's pro- making good products and and you know and you know to take the recommendation from your healthcare professional as part of your your your, your health regimen uh, to make sh- and also to make sure that you add everything up because. There's, you know, there's some things that can be toxic at high doses, and this ingredient might be in multiple products. So make sure that you're not taking too much of anything. You know, this is why, I mean, look, in, in reality, no one needs an accountant. 
right? You could do your own accounting. But the reason why we get accountants is because, you know, we, we, you know, we more likely they'll do the right things and help us, you know, not get in trouble with the IRS. Same thing with dietary supplements. Anyone can go and buy supplements anywhere. But I heard, I always urge people get an expert uh, because sometimes you do need there's some there's a maintenance dose and then there's a therapeutic dose and you don't know the difference. Um, and naturopathic doctors, of course, and functional med- medicine and integrative doctors would know what that looked like. So I think it's always good to um, get the uh, advice from a, from a healthcare professional that knows knows about these things. Um, Michael, how can people learn more about you or your business? Well, my business, I have a website, very simple. Uh, my, name is, my business is Michael Schaefer LLC, and my website is mschaeferllc.com. So it's, uh, um, it has a little bit of a history about my company and, and on there and, uh, and a little bit of what I do. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm pretty much available at all times. I answer just about every single email, every single day. That is remarkably <laughs> true. Look, I, I, I'm a, I consider myself a hard worker. I get up really early and then I work out and then I start working, whether it's writing or things or answering emails. And, and then I go to the clinic or I do telehealth and then right, I, I work. You make me feel like the laziest person in the world every time we speak and, and every time I call you or email you is like an immediate response the most unbelievable thing and it's almost like if they if like you have clones that are working uh, with you it's unbelievable so that's uh that well yeah. we'll put your website on our show notes um and and uh and if anybody wants to be in touch with you they can do so uh, that way yep no i'm gonna try to try to be as accommodating and helpful as possible um that's i'm, I'm here to serve you know as, as best i can yeah to make sure that people have the, the healthiest lives they can yep and and thank you for the work you do look we we benefit in a lot of the um patients and and, and customers that go to expo wellness and mr happy i am mr happy.com they benefit from the work you do because uh you help put these uh wonderful formulas together in a bottle and uh keep us healthy and and with, with safe formulas. Um, Michael, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, be with me here on this podcast. Uh, I hope to, uh, I, I hope, I hope to see you uh, sometime soon at the next convention or so. Yes, yes. I, before I, I, I think I will be uh, in New York again in April. So, oh, so uh, but maybe we can get together. So, yeah. Why don't you call me and we'll get together? Okay. That'd be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Have a have nice holidays if I don't talk you to you. Too. All right, Michael. Thanks so much. Be well. 